Started to say, and I noticed that my my old boss at Madisonville Community College, Debbie Cox, is on the line, and uh, uh, you know she could testify to my strong uh, or lack of belief in in uh, technology in higher education or in the classroom. But uh, it is an it is a wonderful opportunity, given everything that's going on in the world, that we could meet like this on Zoom. Um, I have been very reluctant to get out and do in-person events. This was, you know, set up about a year ago to be a book signing, and I wish I was there in Paducah uh, to be with you, but this is, uh, provides an opportunity for some people uh, who are long distance away to be part of this, this talk. So I uh, wanted to thank again uh, Bill for his kind introduction. And this is the second time that I've uh, spoken to the uh, Jackson Purchase Historical Society during this project. In 2015, I had just completed an article for the Kentucky Historical Society Register. They did a two volume uh, or a special two edition uh, uh, piece on Kentucky in the 20th century. And I wrote the article on Western Kentucky for that. And uh, so I had a chance to talk about uh, this project. At the time, I probably thought about finishing this book in two to three years. Um, it's taken a little longer. And uh, partly uh, one, of the th one of the things that came up over the course of the next six years, it looked like the University Press of Kentucky was on its last uh, uh, breath, uh, Governor Bevan had zeroed out the appropriation to the university press uh, before he left office. And I was so happy to see the universities step up and help to make up the funding loss that the legislature uh, cut out. And uh, then normal things, uh, peer review that you go through in writing a book for an academic press um, you know, cause delays, but the last two years with the, with the virus gave me a lot of seat time. And in, over the course of that, um, I changed the direction uh, in a, you know, in, in a big way. One of the readers, um, outside readers, suggested that I put too much emphasis or, you know, too much, uh, uh, you know, I, I was concentrating too much on developments in Washington and Frankfurt in that I needed to turn my, my camera around, my lens around to look at what was happening back in Western Kentucky, which I did. Um, I discovered and I, I greatly appreciated uh, newspapers online. I think if, you know, when I die, I'm going to leave whatever money I have left to that. Uh, newspaper online allowed me uh, searchable access to uh, the Paducah Sun Democrat, the Owensboro Papers, uh, Madisonville Papers, and several others that I 
found very, very useful. And, uh, and you know, it, it really changed, I think, in a very positive way, the final product. Um, let me, if I could indulge you for a second, I'd like to share a story uh, from the, uh, this story comes from uh, what was called the Good Roads Movement uh, of the pre-First World War period. Uh, the Good Roads people were advocating for, well, you know, better roads in, in not only Kentucky, but throughout the country. And anyway, there was a story that kind of goes like this, that two farmers uh, met one day on the road that, that passed by their, their homes, and it had recently rained, so the hole that they were standing nearby was uh, turned to a big mud puddle. And on top of this mud puddle, they, they spy a, a, a man's hat. So one of, the, one of the farmers gets his fishing rod and you know, casts his, his, his line in to try to retrieve this hat. As he begins reeling the hat in, a man's head suddenly appears. And the farmer says, uh, uh, why you poor fellow, you are in an awful fix. And the, the, the fellow that uh, is emerging says, well, I don't mind it very much, the man uh, the, he replied calmly, but it is very pretty hard on my horse. Um, and the point of the story, you know, I don't know if it, uh, if it translates to the 21st century, um, but I, I wanted to kind of uh, establish that Western Kentucky um, at the start of my period, which is the uh, beginning of the New Deal, was really closer to the 19th century in so many, uh, so many ways. Roads. Uh, I, 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 I have a map in my book that I very much like. It's a reproduction of a 1931 Kentucky road map. And if you could see it, uh, you would see that virtually there are no uh, hard surface roads in Western Kentucky. What we know as US highways, and they, by 1931, we did have U.S. highways in the, in Western Kentucky, uh, but they were mainly gravel and dirt roads. Okay, uh, so people back then talked about uh, being in the mud, and um, then other you know if you look at other other measures, uh, very few uh, people in rural Kentucky had electricity. Uh, uh, you know, telephones were, were, were you know, rare in, in many homes. Uh, of course, we no air conditioning. Uh, so in, in so many, many, many ways, uh, Western Kentucky was much closer uh, at that time to the 19th century. By the time I finish in, uh, you know, my story sort of ends in, in the mid-1990s, we had not only gone through transistors, but we were already into, uh, into uh, microchips. And so the, you know, hard surface roads, uh, you know, everybody has electricity. Many people are starting to have home computers, uh, air conditioning in mo most homes. Uh, so, you know, uh, Western Kentucky goes through a, a pretty dramatic change over that uh, basically 60 year period. Um, so uh, I'd have to say, you know, that, you know, one of the, you know, I saw this as a possible book many years ago. I, I was still working in Oklahoma where I worked as a, as the research director for the Oklahoma House of Representatives. And I had uh, worked on a number of research projects uh, back there, but we were, uh, my wife and I we had plans uh, to move back to Western Kentucky. And I saw that there was a real opportunity, I, I felt, for a book uh, dealing with Western Kentucky. There's almost nothing uh, published on what I, what I term Western Kentucky. And yet it, what was so strange is that uh, in terms of politics, uh, Western Kentucky produced a, a number of very important uh, political figures. And Bruce, uh, you know, if I could call on you, you might bring up some of my slides here. Um, 
one of the first figures that I deal with is uh, the man on the left in the open car. Everybody should recognize the man on the right there waving his hat. That's Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, to the left uh, is Ruby LaFoon from Madisonville. And of course, he was governor from 1931 through 1935. Um, and uh, I tend to uh, treat him as, you know, I, I think I give him a more favorable treatment than a lot of historians. Uh, you know, historians have viewed his uh, term in office as a failure, um, you know, largely because uh, his efforts to get a state sales tax. Um, you know, ended up being overturned uh, very quickly. And if you want to pass, go to the next slide. Okay, here's a picture of LaFoon again. Um, and if you could, he's sort of in the left, uh, you know, center left. Uh, the man standing to the right is a figure you may recognize. It was, uh, that's Happy Chandler who was LaFoon's Lieutenant Governor. Uh, you know, what's, you know, a couple of remarkable things is the age difference. You can see, you know, LaFoon is, is considerably older, looking more tired. Uh, you know, this was actually from the inauguration, but, uh, you know, the story goes around about, uh, about Happy Chandler is that he was so eager to be on the ticket in 1931 that he uh, had to kneel down and beg LaFoon to allow him to run with LaFoon on, as Lieutenant Governor. Uh, I don't know how true that is, but that's, you know, that's a story that goes around in Hopkins County anyway. But the two men over the course of the LaFoon administration end up being bitter political enemies. Uh, Chandler fought ev at every turn uh, LaFoon's efforts to pass the sales tax. Uh, LaFoon, despite uh, looking so so tired here, was a, a determined uh, governor. And finally, before he leaves office, gains control of the legislature, uh, gets his, his sales tax passed, and appeared to have a very strong hand in, over Kentucky politics. Uh, Thomas Ray was uh, not happy Chandler, but Thomas Ray from Russellville uh, was LaFoon's choice to replace him. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of had to laugh. Uh, Henry Ward, who I'll talk about several times over the course of this morning, uh, Henry Ward was a young um, state legislator from Paducah, uh, also was a reporter for the Paducah Sun Democrat, uh, remarked after the passage of the sales tax that Chandler's political career was dead. Um, that says something, I guess, about uh, Henry Ward as a, um, uh, as a political prophet. Any case, it appeared that, uh, you know, LaFoon had a plan to, um, in, to hold what, uh, a, a Democratic convention to pick, to pick the candidate to run after him. And governors at that time course, could only serve one term. But uh, if, you know, with, with, uh, with uh, LaFoon's control of the Democratic Party, the convention would almost assuredly had allowed him to uh, name his successor. Well, LaFoon makes a mistake, uh, goes to Washington, and uh, as soon as, as he crosses the state line by rail, uh, uh, Happy Chandler uh, stepped in called a special session to try to get a primary. Um, the big fight ensues, uh, Happy Chandler wins. The court said, well, he was acting governor and he was within his uh, legal rights to call the special session. And out in the countryside, there was strong, strong support for a primary. So um, a primary is held, uh, Chandler runs against uh, uh, LaFoon's chosen successor, Tom Ray. Ray wins in the, uh, in, in the initial primary, but in a runoff primary, uh, Chandler defeats LaFoon and goes on to have a, a, he'll have a, a, have a very successful career. One of the first things that, uh, that Chandler did, and one of the things he was mostly consistent about 
over his career was his, uh, his opposition to the sales tax. So he, one of the things he used to run against Tom Ray in the campaign was that you know if he was elected, he would repeal the sales tax, which he did. Okay, next slide. Okay, uh, here's another uh, you know important political figure or two actually from Western Kentucky. Uh, the man in the center is uh, Earl Clements from Morganfield. Um, he was governor from 1947 to 1950, and then U.S. senator uh, until 1956. Standing to the right of him, or you know, uh, uh, to your right, I guess, uh, is uh, is uh, Henry Ward, who was his uh, conservation director. And Henry Ward is a very important figure. In fact, that's the subject of the article that I that I'm expected to have in the uh, uh, upcoming issue of the of the uh, uh, of the journal. As you know, I've got an article on Henry Henry Ward, um, and Henry Ward is very very important in Western Kentucky um, as the father of Kentucky State Parks and as a major figure in the development of our state road system. Okay, Bruce, you can go to the next slide. Okay, here's another picture of Happy Chandler. And uh, he uh, was not only governor from 1930, uh, 35 through 38, uh, but you know, of course he was US Senator for a number of years. And then he came back uh, for a second term in 1955. Um, a little fun here is the man to his right uh, is somebody that uh, is distant relate, distantly related to me, uh, Robert Humphreys. Um, never had heard of him, but he was raised in the same small uh, community in Hickman County, Fulgham, that my grandfather was from. And uh, uh, Robert Humphreys was, was Chandler's right-hand man as campaign chairman. He was known as Mr. Democrat. Uh, many years he served as the head of the Kentucky Democratic Party. He was two times uh, state highway commissioner and he replaced um, uh, Alvin Barkley uh, for a brief period when Barkley died in 1956. So that's my cousin, Bob. <laughs> Go ahead, Bruce. Okay, uh, this slide, uh, the man sitting to our right at the table is, is Net, Governor Ned Breathitt from Hopkinsville, uh, very important governor. Um, and, uh, but I'm gonna mention, spend a little time on the woman to the left. One of the things I regret is that I, I, I do not have as many women in, in my book as I wish I could, but that, that was the nature of politics at the time. But the, this woman is, it's, her name is Kathleen Peden. Uh, she's from Hopkinsville as well. Uh, she was a classmate of Ned Breathitt. And she was a very strong, important uh, political figure in her days. Uh, she uh, she, uh, she uh, elbowed uh, Harry Lee Waterfield out. Harry Lee Waterfield was a lieutenant governor during the, the uh, uh, breath of administration and Waterfield wanted to take the lead on economic development, um, which was one of the charges that, that Kathleen Peden had. And she bested uh, uh, Harry Lee Waterfield in that regard. And she ran a very strong uh, campaign in 1968 for US Senator, uh, losing in a bad year for Democrats but uh, she, she performed very well. Okay, next slide. Okay, this is, uh, uh, this is Wendell Ford from Owensboro. Uh, Wendell Ford was governor, of course, from uh, 1971 through 1975, and then later U.S. Senator. He's sitting at his desk um, uh, trying to, uh, 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 you know, respond to what was, uh, you know, a series of tornadoes at the time. He's, uh, manning the the desk, uh, barking out orders, I guess. So, and next slide. 
Um, one of the things, since we're, you, uh, you all, uh, many of you are connected to the Jackson Purchase, uh, one of the source spots for the Jackson Purchase was that uh, uh, the area had never had a governor up until 1975. Um, Jackson Purchase was, was uh, you know, reliably democratic um, area, but, uh, the, and, and uh, several uh, Jackson Purchase uh, political figures had run for governor, um, including Alvin Barkley, Barkley in 1923 um, and H Harry Lee Waterfield in 1947, um, Harry Lee Waterfield again in 1959, uh, Henry Ward in 1967. All of them ran strong, uh, strong campaigns, but failed to to win the uh, the governor's chair, uh, this is a this is something uh, a campaign thing that I picked up from Western Kentucky University. Ford and and uh, and uh, um, Julian uh, uh, Julian, gosh, I knew they'd do this. Uh, somebody could help me. Oh. Uh, Julian Carroll, I'm sorry, from Paducah, uh, were actually political enemies. Um, uh, in the 1971 uh, primary, Ford ran a very difficult race against his old boss, uh, Bert Combs. And, uh, and anyway, Julian Carroll aligned himself with Combs uh, as, as lieutenant governor and uh, made both Wendell Ford and his political uh, 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 confidant, uh, J.R. Uh, J. R. Miller, very upset. And so there was never any close feelings between the two men. But uh, uh, anyway, when, uh, when the opportunity came up, the vacancy came up for US Senate, um, uh, uh, Julian Carroll convinced Wendell Ford and the other uh, key figures in the Democratic Party would be the, the best interests of the party if Ford was to step step down and allow Julian Carroll. So that's, you know, 1970, uh, 75, or actually, I guess, 1974 is the first and only time that the Jackson Purchase uh, had somebody in the governor's chair in Frankfurt. Um, so anyway, um, I'd like to spend a few minutes um, just talking about a, uh, a couple of things that I encountered along the way. One of the more interesting uh, uh, considerations that I had to face was um, what to what to you know include in Western Kentucky. Uh, I found that there was uh, you know a, a great number of different um, uh, efforts to try to. Uh, uh, present the, the what I call Western Kentucky, and um, I had people that disagreed with me, including Warren County, uh, to which I said, well, so long as Western Kentucky University is uh, in Bowling Green, I feel like Western Kentucky uh, needed to include Bowling Green. I even had some people that disagreed with me, including the Jackson Purchase in Western Kentucky. Um, but again, I, you know, that just didn't make sense. So to me, what I define Western Kentucky is uh, starting from the Eastern border, going down through Hancock, uh, Ohio, Butler, Warren and Simpson County. Uh, that represents about 20, well, it represents 28 counties, 28% uh, of the state's land mass and approximately uh, uh, 17 or 18 percent of the state's population. Um, as I think that, uh, uh, as as uh, Bill mentioned, Western Kentucky was the strongest, most most uh, blue part of Western Kentucky. This slide kind of tells a story. Um, it looks at the uh, at the general elections from 1927 to 1959. And in the second column, you can see uh, that, uh, you know, 
essentially, if a Democrat couldn't win Western Kentucky by, I would say, at least 50,000 votes, uh, they were going to have a very difficult time winning. In fact, you know, I've concluded that, you know, there's a way of looking at what at Kentucky, not so much as a democratic state in those days, but that we were basically a toss up state um, with, you know, if, if you pulled out uh, Western Kentucky. So from, uh, you know, if you look at Ruby Lafoon's uh, Happy Chandler, King Johnson, uh, Earl Clements, you look at all these Democratic winners, their uh, majorities in the races, you know, had to be nearly about 50, per, I mean, Western Kentucky was about 50% of the Democratic majority in their November elections. Okay. Um, this, uh, this, you know, certainly changes. And I say, you know, uh, uh, you know, I locate the change in 1994. Um, that was the particular, that particular year, both the first and second congressional districts, which had been uh, forever, I mean, forever Democratic, um, both, you know, that year, both congressional districts, uh, 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 you know, elected Republicans um, and have been in the hands of Republicans ever since. Um, I think Bill alluded to, you know, well, why, why the change? How do you explain the change? And um, I'm not sure I have, I have the answer. I have an answer. Um, and a lot of people will say, well, it was civil rights. You know, they go back to the 1955 uh, or 1954 uh, Brown decision and then, you know, go a little bit further. The civil rights legislation of the 1960s, uh, LBJ's comments that passage of, the, of those bills effectively gave the South to the Republican parties, uh, you know, Republican parties for you know, in the future. And I tend to not agree with that position because you're talking about, you know, if that was the case, why did it take so long for Western Kentucky to become Republican? We're talking 40 years. Um, I tend to see the, the change as more incremental and really the change is focused on the, on the divisive social issues of our time, um, you know, the slogan, God's guns and gays. Um, and I, I kind of look, look at what happens in the 19, 1960s uh, with Supreme Court rulings ending prayer in school, followed by the Equal Rights Amendment. And the uh, Kentucky was an early, uh, early uh, in terms of ratifying the ERA. And then uh, opposition, particularly strong in Western Kentucky, and you know, centered in Owensboro and Mayfield, um, but there developed a very strong movement uh, to rescind the vote on the ERA, which, uh, which ultimately was passed. Um, and then go, you know, that led straight into abortion and a number of other issues, homosexuality, gay rights, uh, gun rights, and on and on. And, uh, you know, I think that that tended to, uh, you know, be the be the cause or causes for the for the shift. So that by the time that I finish up in the 1994, uh, and you know, many of you could, you know, have probably heard this that you know the idea that you can't be a Christian and a Democrat, or that uh, I didn't leave the Democratic Party; it left me. Uh, you know, that's a general feeling I think, uh, in, among many in Western Kentucky and, and uh, uh, you know, that has, has continued to today. Um, I'll just, you know, I, I'll just say a couple of more things. I think that, uh, uh, that the, you know, I've been generally pleased with the reception to my work. Um, and I, I'm hoping that, you know, that others will see that the emphasis on, on on uh, regional history is very valid. I think that in many cases that the failure um, to look at the differences between our regions, um, you know, skews, skews 
uh, Kentucky history. Uh, one of the things that, uh, uh, you know, if we talk about, uh, you know, the Civil War and Reconstruction and, you know, the old line that comes from uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Colton is the idea that Kentucky was the, was a, uh, became Southern after the Civil War, that we were the only, one of the only societies that ever joined a lost cause after the cause was lost. Um, and I, I think that, uh, you know, work by people like, uh, 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 oh, uh, uh, oh gosh, uh, Barry Craig and several others have proved that in the case of at least the Jackson Purges, that the Jackson Pur Purges was Confederate long before uh, Kentucky, you know, moved over into the opposition uh, to the uh, to the Union cause, and I think we see, uh, you know, there's there, there's a number of places where uh, where we have histories written on, on Kentucky tobacco that's written from the point of view of of of, of uh, you know that excludes I guess experience in our dark fire tobacco, and I know I think Bobby. Uh, Bobby Smith Bryant is on, on the on this this call and and I think she's you know she's very uh, provides a lot of information about the importance of dark fire tobacco and uh, so anyway and I'm I'm going to kind of you know turn it over back over for questions and answers. George, this is this is Bill. I'm Mulligan. Are there any individuals whom you would see as being more significant in the transition than others? Did it just happen sort of from the grassroots up or were there politicians looking to focus on these issues as a way to gain control for the Republican Party? You know, I tend to see it, um, uh, uh, you know, more from the grassroots. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you take the ERA and I spent, you know, I mean, there's others have spent more time on this than I have, but, uh, uh, you know, that these, you know, that there were these grassroots organizations that formed in, in um, you know, throughout the state, but particularly in Western Kentucky, like I said, around Owensboro and Mayfield that put pressure and in many cases, uh, uh, politicians who had voted for the ERA, and then we're talking, uh, you know, about six years that it took to finally, uh, uh, you know, vote for rescinding the uh, ERA. Um, uh, but many who had voted for it uh, reversed themselves over time and voted for rescission. Um, now there were there were several politicians that uh, you know uh, comes to mind Lloyd Clapp from. Uh, from Wingo, a longtime House member who was uh, very active, but you know he also, I mean, he lived in the Mayfield area, and, and so uh, you know again the grassroots and the connection there. But L Lloyd Clapp was a political leader in in that effort. But uh, um, so I, I, you know, I tend to see it uh, more from as, as a grassroots type of thing. One other, I guess, thing that pops into my mind, I believe there are still more registered Democrats in Kentucky than Republicans. Yeah. And the transition seems to have occurred at the national level rather than at the state level. Is that just a superficial view or is there some, some substance there? Um, well, of course, in terms of registration, until recently, I mean, any number of people will tell me that uh, when they went to register to vote, um, you know that they're that they perhaps thought about registering as independent or Republican, uh, but when they registered, the uh, election official, you know, would kind of raise their eyebrow and say, "Are you sure?" Because until recently, um, you you virtually had to be a Democrat if you were going to, um, you know, uh, uh, have a, have a voice in the primary in the primaries until you know ten or fifteen years ago, um, you know. I mean, that's where the local elections were decided. Um, does that help? So I guess, you know, we have a lot of legacy Democrats who are, um, you know, who are 
still registers Democrats, some of them, you know, not now moving over to the Republican Party. I will, I, this is Bruce Dobbins, I'll add an interesting story. The uh, chair of the Republican Party for a while was across the street from the church I last served, and she asked me to pray, and, and I, I went and prayed over the Republican thing. It was kind of boot when I said I came across the aisle, and they all booed me, but... <laughs> McConnell's on my left, right. But she was telling me her story that when they moved to Mayfield, she went up to register at the courthouse and she said, I want to register. And she said, well, if you don't register Democrats, you're not going to be voting in any primaries. And she said that made her mad. So she registered Republican just to go against the grain. So that, that was actually the story that had happened. We have uh, Bobby. Uh, do you want to go ahead and ask your question on mute, please? Sure. I just wanted to add, um, George, you might want to mention the influence that the newspaper editors um, had on um, on campaigns as well. I thought that was a nice aspect that you added in the book. Over time, uh, of course, uh, back in the in the 1920s, 1930s, the uh, newspapers in the region were largely, but they, they were, you know, self-proclaimed democratic uh, organs. Um, you know, they, they, uh, they represented the interests of the, of the Democratic Party. Uh, of course, that's no longer true. And, um, you know, the, the, the Paducah Sun Democrat is now the Paducah Sun. Um, and, uh, you know, and of course the Paducah, uh, the uh, 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 Paxton group owns what the uh, Paducah, uh, the Owensboro, uh, the Madisonville papers, plus several other smaller papers. Um, I think they exercise a pretty strong uh, editorial line in the Paducah paper, not so much maybe in Owensboro or, or, uh, or Madisonville as, as in Paducah. But, uh, you know, the newspapers have, have changed. They're no longer, you know, they're reluctant to write political, you know, to endorse people as they once did. Um, and, uh, you know, the, one, of the, one of the sad stories, I think, you know, and, and you know, somebody needs to write this is um, the newspapers, you know, as an opinion leader um, has diminished so much. When I came to back to Kentucky in 2004 um, and uh, uh, Penny, Penny Miller, who wrote a wrote a, uh, a, a political and a historical book on Kentucky, talked about um, the things that unite Kentucky, and it was University of Kentucky basketball, uh, KET, and the Courier Journal. Um, well, you know, the Courier Journal changed, but, you know, shortly after I came back, um, the Courier Journal used to have uh, bureaus in the eastern and western part of the state, and now it's it's, 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 it's so focused on what happens in, in Jefferson and neighboring counties. And this has been replicated in Owensboro. Uh, Owensboro had a desk here in Muhlenberg County where I live. And that's no longer the case. Um, and I think it's probably true in Paducah, you know, that the, these, these important, um, you know, sources for opinion have become so localized. And one of the one of the things I was thinking about, um, and and I and I I I, I, had, I just didn't have the time to get into it, but when I turned to see what was happening at the local level, what I was really impressed by was the um, the uh, the civic engagement, um, the, you know the, the the local groups that work so hard for uh, getting TVA, uh, you know cheap. Uh, public power in the region, um, or improving roads, getting state parks, you know, uh, you know these uh, uh, freeing freeing the tolls on bridges. That was a big thing in the in the 1930s and 1940s. Um, any case, I don't see that same level of civic engagement today. Um, you know, the emphasis. I mean, you know, the emphasis on. Uh, divisive social issues. I don't see uh, the Western Kentucky political caucus um, as taking a leadership role as they perhaps should be in terms of improving matters here in Western Kentucky. 
Hi, I'm Brent Taylor. Uh, I'm, I was kind of curious about the Republicans in the 20s. I had noticed that they were fairly strong prior to the Great Depression. Is, is that the sort of thing that, that you saw as making a comeback after the Depression era with the Republican uh, resurgence or something else? I'm sorry, I, I couldn't get that. Uh, you're cutting in and out of me. Okay. So in the 1920s, the Republicans had appeared to be gaining momentum in the state. Oh, yes. Okay. Then the Depression happened. Yeah. So, the, so then once the Depression was over, was it that kind of 1920s Republican Party that was making a comeback or was it something else? Well, you know, the, the, what you see is as strength in the 1920s. Um, and if, uh, if Dwayne Bolin was on the line, he could help me with this. But uh, uh, there was a, a political bossism, uh, you know, Kentucky from, you know, in, in those days uh, was, was uh, to a large extent um, run by the political or, you know, the economic interests of the state. And there was a bipartisan combine um, that actually uh, backed uh, Governor Flem, Flem Sampson in the 1927 election. And so it was, a, you know, it wasn't uh, the Republican Party per se. It was, a, you know, the, the combined interests of the political vested interest, I guess, in Kentucky that helped elect him. But yeah, um, by 1931, uh, with the Depression, uh, you know, the, the Republican Party was pretty much dead um, in, you know, here, and of course, in 1932, that, that was the case across the nation. Parker. Hello, I'm Richard Parker, uh, Vice President of the Society. Yes. So uh, my question is, I was curious to uh, the influence Alvin Barkley had uh, on actual uh not handpicking candidates, but endorse, endorsing candidates um, from D.C. Did that occur any? Uh, uh, of him, uh, Barkley sort of stood aside, um, you know, Democratic politics in the period I'm looking at, uh, or at least up until the 19, 1970s, was bifactional. And Barkley during, you know, of course, he was gone after 1956. But uh, Barkley tended to stand outside of the factions he, or stood above it. Um, uh, now he, he did get very involved. Um, you know, uh, one of the things I, you know, we could have talked about was 1938 uh, senatorial election, one of the more important elections where Barkley um, as incumbent US Senator and as Senate Majority Leader, um, you know, uh, runs, well, uh, Happy Chandler, the incumbent governor, uh, uh, ran against him for U.S. Senate that year. And there, I'd say there was never any loss of, or there was not a great deal of love that existed between Chandler and Barkley. And uh, Barkley, uh, I think, deviated from his uh, reluctance to get involved in primary primaries in 1955 when he campaigned against Happy Chandler and for Burt Combs. But that's, so he was not what I would consider a, uh, a kingmaker in the sense that say uh, uh, Earl Clements or uh, Smith Broadbent from Katie's or J.R. Miller from Owensboro or Doc Beecham from Russellville. Uh, those are all Western Kentucky, what you would call kingmakers. Um, but I don't. I don't think of Barkley in that in that same vein. Interesting. Yeah, I was just curious too. I was trying to make a connection when you were talking about there was, you know, no governor uh, besides uh, uh, Carroll from the purchase area, and I was just curious. You know, I would but, think. You know, when... in, in 1923, he ran a, mm -hmm. ran a ran a credible, you know, strong contest. Uh, but the uh, you know my reading of that is that the. You know the this bipartisan combine, the uh, you know horse racing, uh, coal and uh, other 
uh, economic interests in the state, um, you know, liquor interests, uh, you know, because Barclay was during it, during, during that period, uh, pro, you know, for prohibition. Um, but they were reluctant to get behind Barclay and probably was just as glad to see him go off to the U.S. Senate. How are you doing? Daniel uh, Hertz. I have a question for you. Um, you know, one of the things that I thought was really interesting is that it seems like in the last couple of decades that we've elected Republicans at the federal level, but still elect Democrats to the constitutional offices in Kentucky. So while you might have a Mitch McConnell and a Jim Bunning in Washington, or even your congressman might be a Republican like Whitfield or Comer was, you'd still elect a Brereton Jones or Paul Patton or even a Stephen Andy Bashir. And you'd also elect like Bill Clinton would win the state. So it's interesting to me that like you have Democrats even winning in the Electoral College while at the same time electing and reelecting consistently people like McConnell and Jim Bunning. Why do you think uh, that is? You know, I think that's, a, that's you know, not, not the normal case, but I do note that, uh, or I did note in my research that uh, in the case of, uh, you know, particularly Steve Bashir, uh, that Bashir uh, did exceedingly well in Western Kentucky. Uh, and, I attribute that to uh, poor candidates that the Republicans, uh, you know, uh, Ernie Fletcher in, uh, you know, you know, had become very uh, unpopular um, in his one term as governor. And uh, so, you know, Bashir is, you know, uh, won all but Butler County in what I call Western, Western Kentucky in that campaign. And then David Williams was not a, not a very popular figure. And so again, Bashir swept, uh, swept Western Kentucky. And even in the case of Andy Bashir, you know, of course, Steve Bashir, you know, is from Dawson Springs. So that didn't hurt him right. in, in Western Kentucky. And his son, Andy, uh, although he didn't win in Western Kentucky, uh, you know, uh, ran pretty well. And again, you know, I think Bashir uh, benefited from a very, you know, running against a very unpopular. Uh, Republican incumbent. Um, I, you know, if if the Republicans can put up, uh, uh, you know, uh, candidates who are popular, I think that you know, for the time foreseeable future, um, I I don't know that the Democrats can um, can run strong in Western Kentucky. Western Kentucky has one. Uh, Democrat in the General Assembly. That's uh, 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 Patty Patty Minter from Bowling Green. Only one. You know, we had a series of conversations. He was he noted a couple of weeks ago that in the case of the Jackson Purchase, not one Democrat filed for any of the open legislative seats in the Jackson Purchase. Uh, it's a little better over in this part of the of Western Kentucky, but. Um, on the whole, uh, you know, even getting uh, viable candidates to run, you know, for the for the general assembly uh, in Western Kentucky is difficult. This is Bruce Dobbins again. It's just interesting to note that uh, Democrats, the few of us that are down there in Mayfield, Graves County. Uh, last election, we had several, two or three people in our county level ran as Democrats, and as soon as they got elected, uh, changed to Republican. And yeah. Boy, does that make a party upset. You know, we help you get elected and then you abandon this kind of thing. And we virtually don't have anybody in the county left, I think, Democrat. Uh, wow. Everybody's gone Republican and even having trouble getting a Democrat to even be seated on the election board, which is mandatory. Uh, and everybody else is a Republican, the sheriff and everybody's involved. So it, it, it gets a little scarier at times because that got huge county. Um, had something like 25, 30 precincts, we're going to six. So yeah. if you don't have a vehicle to get around, it's, you know, again, trying to take away voting rights from people. Uh, it, it, and it was questioned, and basically our Democratic candidate on that board at that time, the election board was told to shut her mouth uh, yeah. and not to make it public. Yeah. Because yeah. it was very interesting. She, she was just kind of almost beat down by every... Republican in this county, 
uh, that don't don't disrupt the process. And we got to questioning whether the election board is actually you, in open survey meetings. In Western Kentucky, in terms of it can, judges, it, you're on there. Can you majority open your mouth about what goes out. on? You know, and I, I, I never did find any anything from the election board statewide uh, or anywhere uh, else as we looked that at that a number that could answer the, that question. Uh, of our you know, county does the election boards in the county the have the right not privilege of not saying anything to public really until they get it back from the yeah. state and yeah. all that? So, I think if anybody's got an answer out there for me, Bruce would like to know. That's not a normal <laughs> situation. When I gave that prayer for the um, breakfast before Fancy Farm for the Republicans and said I stepped across the aisle and got booed, uh, <laughs> was I before I did my prayer and I said Campbell and Alexander Campbell was an active politician at the founding of our church. Um, it was interesting. After I sat down, uh, Governor Bevan pointed me out and said, it's never the wrong time to do the right thing, Pastor Dobbins. I'm a Republican. Well, everybody in the room cheered, and I just, okay, whatever. You know, but it was funny. Uh, I, I kind of did that because of um, the, knowing how the congregation was, that, you know, I, I, I can step across the aisle and do some things, can't you, once in a while? Uh, because, you know, very hardcore conservatives in their religious beliefs as well as their political. And a lot of them were shocked to death. You went and prayed over the Republicans. Well, they're, they're people too. God loves them somehow. I'm not sure how, but 